Voilà. OK. Let's start the first lecture of the course. Uh, so we first made a kickoff. And so this first lecture is uh, designed to introduce the goals and perimeter of uh, the entire course. Uh, so about uh, the sustainability challenges. And uh, this lecture is mainly based on, uh, on uh, the sustainable development transition lecture given um, at uh, UCL. That is a, a course given, and, and uh, I think it is the second year of bachelor, the third year of bachelor for, for the engineers. But also, it is designed based uh, on some uh, on some slide of the sustainable development bachelor uh, lecture of the Liège University, because now the first year of bachelor, they have, they have access to. Uh, a very small course about sustainability and also about um, other materials and uh, the credits will be given, but uh, also about Jean-Marc uh, Jancovici. So, first question. Uh, so, I already asked you this one was it sustainable development for you, but uh, you, you were not there. So, so what, what is that? There is no, it's not a tricky question. I'm just uh, like that. What is for you sustainable development in a few words? But in your own words, what is for you? And what is ah, just for you? For you, not based on uh, something else. Ah. For you, what, what would it be? Something with the development, which respect the environment, which is a, a long term development. Okay, so long term yes. and environment. Yes. So it is us, but also the environment, environment and the long term. Yes. But we all come up with the same. Uh, not a tricky question. Sorry. So yes, okay. So, but uh, may, maybe there, there exists uh, some definitions of sustainable development, and uh, one was given in a report uh, that is uh, that is our common future. It is also known as the, the Brutland Report. So it is it was published uh, more than thirty years ago now, and it defines uh, sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. So in that definition, we have the, the long-term aspect. We have also uh, the, 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 the because, because of course, if we use all the resources now, our future generation will not have it, but it doesn't talk about the, doesn't really talk about the environment. It, it's more like implicit because, okay, of course, if we use everything now, uh, probably they will have nothing else in the future, but, the environment, environment is not uh, put directly into the, to the sentence. But it was one of the first uh, definition uh, about sustainable development. And so you, uh, I, I give you the, the, the credit if you want to have a look at, at the report, uh, you can have it. But it, was, it is one of the definitions. There are other, the other definitions. So I saw you one uh, of the schematic uh, that come from the limits of growth. So it is a, a report that, is, uh, that was written more than uh, 50 years ago, and uh, it was one of the first simulation of, uh, of the, our global system uh, studied by computer. And so it was commissioned by the Club of Rome, and they were, uh, they, it was presented uh, so at, uh, at a conference, international conference. And so Mido, Mido's, it is also known as the, the Mido's report, because uh, it is one of the, 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 the most, famous, uh, most famous author. And in fact, the prediction at that time uh, with very basic uh, modelization and simulation of the system are not so bad. It, uh, so they, 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 they just model the system with a, a few uh, dynamic equations and they, they uh, model the, 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 the food, the population, the pollution. And uh, it, it follows quite well our, uh, our uh, trajectory now with a very basic model. So sometimes with basic model, you can, you can do something good. And see, uh, so you can see here the, the curves. 
So uh, if you put the data, so if you need to put some parameters into, uh, into that model, you have uh, here major uh, major trend. So here it is the food. You have also uh, the non-renewable non resources. Non, 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 non. Continue, je... Ah, ouais, bonne idée. Je sais pas si elle est là pour food. Okay. And so, so here you have the historical trend plane line. It is the historical trend. So they, 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 uh, they started the simulation in the 70s. And then if you use the model and you put the, the data into, uh, into the model, you have the, the prediction with the points. And here they put uh, what uh, was realized. And you can see that the model is quite good between uh, the prediction and uh, what happened, in fact. And so here you have, so the population uh, has been increasing and it is still increasing. You have the services per capita, the food per capita, the new renewable resources remaining. So we, we have a depletion in the new renewable resources. So new renewable resources, it is raw material, but fuel, fuel energy and fuel energy and so on. And so the thing is that into that model, it seems that we have a peak. And the models with the data right now predicts that uh, in 20, 10, 20 years, Probably, according to this model, uh, we will have uh, used so much uh, non renewable resources that we will not be able to, to, to have food for all uh, the population. And so the population will decrease and so on, et cetera. But of course, it is a model. So a model it is never the broad truth. But maybe it can provide us some uh, direction of research uh, to, to try maybe to to avoid that kind of situation. And so the major trends of that model are the depletion of non-renewable resources, and it has been confirmed, malnutrition, increase in the quality of services, rapid population growth, accelerated industrialization, and deterioration of the environment. Voilà. So, there are also other definitions of sustainable development or way of uh, defining it. One, one way is the pl planetary boundaries. Maybe you have already uh, heard of it. So planetary boundaries, it is based on uh, nine uh, planetary boundaries. So climate change is only one of them. Because most of the time when we talk about sustainability, we, we, we say that it is a climate change. We talk about climate change. climate change. But it is not the only one. So we, we have, for instance, uh, other, uh, other boundary, I will zoom. So for instance, uh, ocean acidification, um, biosphere integrity, land system, fresh water use, uh, biogeochemical, etc. So nine boundaries. And here you have uh, with a uh, color scale. In, in green, it means it's okay. And here it is a, a circle with a uh, a kind of, uh, of limit. And if you go uh, away from that circle, it means that you are uh, using more resources that it should be available to achieve a sustain sustainability. And so it can be uh, quite uh, amazing. But for instance, for climate change, it seems, OK, it's not green, it is in yellow. But when we, we, we hear about all the IPCC report, it seems like we are already in a very uh, red zone. But it seems that according to this definition, it is not the case. So maybe we, we still have time to reverse the situation, but in other uh, fields, it is not the same. So for, for instance, here in uh, ocean acidification, it seems it's still okay, even if we are uh, quite close to, to the boundary or the same for freshwater use. But for other, other fields like uh, land system change, but it seems we have uh, crossed the boundary uh, quite, uh, we are not very far from the red zone and for other, we are already in the red zone. But there's, uh, there's no relationship with the planet. It's just a circle against the planet. Yes, yes, yes. It's a picture of the planet. Planetary boundary. No, no, no. No, no, it's not uh, related to the geography of the planet. It's the point of nice dots. And so here you have the, the, the website. If you want to have more information, you have a, a, a video that explain you uh, the, the, the concept and also a list of key publication. It's, it's um, not just a definition like that. There are some people that uh, 
work on that definition. What, what are the ones that are in the, the red zone? The red, red zone. Uh, so we have, and zoom it. Ah, high resolution, maybe it will be easier. So the biosphere integrity, and then I don't know what means uh, E slash MSY. Uh, maybe it is. Uh, It maybe it is explained uh, somewhere. But, uh, I cannot remember. No, I cannot remember right now. No, I cannot remember right now. Sorry. So this is one of the definition. And if you want to go further, there is also a nice talk uh, at TED uh, Global that uh, is uh, explaining. Uh, Definition and the ability of planet. Earth. I don't know if you have already uh, heard of these uh, TED talks. It's also Maybe. good news because the they are in, in uh, most of so uh, the topics. But business as usual is not an option. And this guy, uh, in fact, we're in a phase where transformative concept, change is necessary, which opens minutes. the window for innovation, so for new ideas, to, uh, a new look at it, you can. This is a scientific journey on the challenges facing humanity in the global phase of sustainability. On this journey, I'd like to bring, apart from yourselves, a So we'll not have a look at it, but uh, I just show you that it exists, and if you want to have a look at it, uh, we can have it. We have also another definition that is quite close. It is called the donut. <laughs> you see, it's, uh, it's approximately the same. So it is also about uh, planetary boundaries. So we have here the climate change, ocean acidification. So you have almost the same, uh, the same, uh, the same zones. And uh, you have here the social foundation and here the ecological sailing. And here it means that it is where we have uh, to stay if we want to achieve uh, a sustainable uh, society. And uh, according uh, to, to that uh, to that plot, here climate change we have uh, we are quite uh, a long way to achieve the sustainability, and uh, then for over uh, field also. But it is approximately the same uh, definition, and here you have also link to, to to dig that topic if you want. And uh, yes, it's quite funny to do that. And so here on this website, you can compare several country, countries uh, by using these definitions. So here, for instance, uh, I selected Belgium. So here we have the donut uh, for Belgium. So that it seems that uh, for Belgium, CO2 emission, uh, but also material footprint, ecological footprint, phosphorus, nitrogen, etc. We are overshooting the limits. And here you, you can see, in fact, uh, the amount of CO2 emission. So it is per, per person and, and in terms of ton per year. So the average in Belgium here, according to this website is around 11, but you have also the figures for the other uh, indicators. And so you can compare to countries. So for instance, if we have a look at our bill of friends of France, <laughs> so approximately the same. So we, it is logic, we, it's the same way of life. So CO2 emission is a little bit, it seems that CO2 emission is a little bit less in France, okay, but phosphorus is higher, but it is almost the same. But if, for instance, if we take uh, the USA, United States, up, CO2 emission is uh, twice uh, as Belgium. And here you have, in fact, the per capita boundary, it means uh, the, the number that we, we, we should be at maximum. So in terms of CO2 emission in Belgium, maybe it is around five times the limit and the USA more than 10 times, 15 times. But so you can see that the United, United States is even worse than Belgium. 
but we can have a look at China. So China CO2 emission are higher than the boundary, but per, per person they are less than uh, Belgium. And it, in fact, if you have a look at it in China, it, it seems. Uh, uh, does it make sense to perform this comparison? When you turn out, for instance, there is an indicator here, land use change that take uh, the way. Uh, it is implicit, but then uh, by reporting, it is a way of uh, reporting uh, emission. But, but not, not the CO2 emission per, per person. Ah, per square, it, it should, of course, per square, uh, United States will be less, but most of the time we, we report the CO2 emission per person because it is a simulation that we, when we use our car or transport or house, it is the way we, we, we have that. But you have also other indicators. So you have, for instance, the social indicators. And so life satisfaction, uh, healthy life expectancy, uh, nutrition. So the donut takes into account ecological uh, saving, but also social foundation. And here you can see that maybe if you have a look at the ecological saving, China seems to be a little bit better on average than Belgium. But if you look at the social foundation, it seems to be, according to these indicators, of course, it seems to be a little bit worse. But, uh, okay. So for democ democratic quality here, it is negative in China. <laughs> I haven't seen that, okay. That you have also, yes, the Gini ending. It's, it's funny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe. Ah, it, it must be that. So you, you can select a country, or you, can, you can compare uh, several countries. I don't know which, which aggregate, for instance, EU. Right. Yeah, so Belgium, it's uh, the average, average of uh, Europe. It's, uh, would be better than Belgium, thanks to, uh, for example, the electricity, which has a much smaller mm. carbon footprint. You can see, in th this is a very good question. I was speaking, so it's, it's nice that you noticed. And here you can see that, in fact, the CO2 emission uh, in terms of, of tons per year are a little bit less in France and Belgium. But you, you, you could tell me, OK, but I, I would have think that it would be much more lower. But in fact, and we will see, uh, we will see that when we have a look at all the primary energy, so the primary energy, it's all the energy that we use for heating, electricity, for the cars, etc. In fact, electricity, it's about one third of the total of primary primary energy, only one third. Maybe, and some in some countries even twenty percent. Yeah. But in some other people, so it depends. Let's say between twenty and thirty percent. And so m m the, the, the major part of the energy, primary energy that we use, it is not, it is not electricity. It is uh, the oil for the cars. It is a gas for the heating and, and so on. And so that's why in fact, okay, there is a, a small difference between Belgium and France, but it is not a significant difference because electricity accounts for maybe 20%. So even if you decrease your CO2 emission by two, by three on 20%, at the end, it will be a difference of 10%. But uh, if you have just a look at uh, the CO2 emission, when you, you zoom on the electricity, if you look at uh, the CO2 emission, in Belgium, it's around 200 grams of uh, CO2 per kilowatt -er. And in France, it's around maybe, it depends, uh, 20, 30, uh, 40 grams. So th there is a significant difference if you have a look only at the electricity, but as it only amounts for 20% of all the energy and all of the rest of the energy, it is oil, coal, and gas. So, but it is a, a, a good question. Uh, okay, so, so we have uh, social thresholds, we have biophysical boundaries. So 
you, 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 you define it when, when I ask you what is sustainable development for you, we all pretty much say that, okay, it is on the long term, it concerns us, but it also concerns the environment. So it's a kind of trade-off between the way we have uh, to live in equilibrium with, with the environment. And so we have the environment, biophysical boundaries, and we have also our social threshold. It is the way we can live in a, in a good way, because uh, of course we, we, we can live, but if we all live in poverty and we don't have food, it will be difficult. So, okay, can be sustainable for the earth if we all live in, all live in poverty, but for us it's not very funny. So the idea, in fact, is to, uh, is to achieve a kind of trade-off between all of these uh, boundaries, and, and the idea that we, we should be some, somewhere there, we would like to be there. And here you have the country of the world, and some countries, they live quite good, and uh, in European countries, um, most of the time it is the case here in Belgium, we have uh, on average, uh, a good uh, uh, quality of life. So of course, some people live in poverty, but the average Belgian person lives uh, with a good uh, social quality of life. And so we are some, somewhere there, but most of the time, these uh, rich countries, they, uh, they uh, overreach the biophysical boundaries. And in other countries, okay, unfortunately, it is in, more in the south part of the world. So for instance, in Africa, so they, they, uh, they have, unfortunately, a very uh, a poor quality of life because sometimes it's difficult even to, to, to find some food. But in the meantime, they do not overreach uh, biophysical boundaries, but they have nothing. So if you don't have a car, if you don't have a house, of course, you, you do not use uh, fossil fuel, for instance. But the idea would be to be there. And on the website, you can have a look on all the country and uh, to know where you are, where we are. This one, it is Vietnam. But I don't know if it does pretty well, but it seems to be more, be more uh, towards the target. So it is Vietnam and here you, so you can find the uh, Belgium is there. Denmark, okay, have a look. Ah, good question, Denmark. Here. It's the same, almost the same. Yeah. That's interesting. I could have thought like you that Denmark was a little bit better, but so if we have a look in terms of CO2 emission, it seems to be a little bit more. It's pretty much the same. And in terms of social indicator, yeah, it's a little bit better. But la ah, life expectancy is less than Belgium. A little bit health, healthy life expectancy is a little bit less than Belgium in Denmark. Uh, but education, uh, yeah, that's a. Uh, uh, but education seems to be a little bit percentage of our running secondary school. Yeah. Social support, okay. Democratic quality, okay. Yeah, well, pretty much the same. <laughs> Sorry? For the percentage of secondary school, there is 122. Percentage of enrollment in secondary school. Yes, we, we, we should have a look closer to that uh, because here, of course, it is 100% because, uh, okay. Uh, but yes, I, I agree with you. This one, it should be, uh, we should be have a look at it. <laughs> Human traffic, yes, maybe. And so another uh, definition. So you, you, you can see that in fact, there are a lot of definition of sustainable development that it is always the same ideas that are behind it. Ecolo ecological boundaries, so climate change, fresh water and so on, and social indicator. And here we have the human development index. And here's the number of earths. So the number of earths, it means that we have one earth, of course. <laughs> but but right now in some country if we extrapolate uh, the resources we need it, 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 to, to, to to live on the long long run we would need several earths 
Okay. And so here, for instance, uh, if we take the countries of Europe or North America, we are more like, uh, depending on, I don't know if it is the United States here, but uh, we are like uh, several, uh, at least two, two Earths. We will need at least two or three Earths. But we are, we are uh, quite good in terms of uh, human development index. But the idea would be to be there. So according to this definition, global, global sustainability, it would be where we would need less than one Earth to live. And with a human development index uh, between uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, sorry, and, uh, and one. Uh, it is the same graph. Okay, so here you have more reference video and so on. Uh, but the human development index is sometimes used uh, in some uh, in some publication. But the idea are the same. Uh, and maybe you have, uh, I think this one you have uh, already heard about it. It is, uh, I, I think every year, uh, sometimes we, we hear in the news, okay, today it is the day we, we achieve, uh, we reach the limit of the resources for that year, meaning uh, that uh, uh, if, we, if, we, if all the resources that we consume, uh, if we, we if the earth needs to, to, to rebuild it again, it would take, uh, if, if, we li if we live in a sustainable way, uh, each year, what we use will be uh, renewed uh, the, the year after. And the way we live uh, on, in some country, we use all the resources in less than one year, meaning it's like a kind of debt uh, to the earth. And so it's like if we are, uh, um, using more resources that the earth can, uh, can, can regenerate. And it is called the country uh, overshoot day. And so here it is difficult, so I, I, I will zoom it. It's difficult to see, but in some country, it is okay. It is uh, more than one year, meaning that the earth has time to, to, to regenerate the resource. And in some other country, it is less than one year. And so for instance, Belgium in 2021, it was March 30. Meaning in March 30, according to this indicator, we use all the resources of the year. So that means that the rest of the year, uh, it's a kind of depth uh, to the earth. In some other country, Qatar, it's 9 February. Okay. Uh, <laughs> nine. Okay. Luxembourg, 15. Yeah. Uh, so Belgium is March 30. Where is France? Ah, France, May 7, Germany, May 5. Uh, but you are, so you can see. That's a good question. Here, Indonesia, it's December 18. Uh, do we have overshoot days that are greater than? Ah, so, oh, don't know this one. Sao Tome on Principi. But it is uh, less than one year. I don't know if there is a country that is achieving uh, less than one year, but may maybe. And so here you have all the, 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 the methodology, in fact, because it's difficult to, 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 to build an ecological footprint. It is based on several indicators. So it's a mix of indicators and they, they, they can be something like that. And every year we hear on the news, oh, it is the day we have uh, reached uh, the limit of, uh, of the year for, for the earth. Belgium. And if you take uh, on average on Earth in 2021, it was July 29. The average uh, of all the country on Earth. Belgium is here. Okay. So we have seen uh, what is uh, some definition of sustainable development. So it is recorded. So, so we, ha we have seen some definition of sustainable uh, development. So you you can see that there are a lot of, lot of definitions, so it's hard to say sustainable, sustainable development, it is that. It's important to say there are many definitions, so it is to show you that you have to criticize all the definitions, but you have always the same uh, key concept. It is about uh, the, the long term. It is about us, but it is also about the environment, and so it combines several uh, indicators, so social indicators, so the way we live, and but also ecological indicators, so climate change, the fresh water, raw material, and so on. But it's important to combine all the, the aspects. 
And so let, let's have a look now about what could be some sustainable uh, development goals. And do, do you know what are the, the 15 uh, sustainable development goals of, uh, that are published by a non-profitable organization? You have already heard about yes. it? Yes. Uh, we had a, a course last year about that. It's a uh, it's, it's uh -huh. uh, I think it's a uh, I remember this, this came up. Uh, okay. Today. And did you remember maybe one or two of them? Uh, no. Yeah. Or what, what could be the topics inside of them? Uh, in, in which course was it? Okay, so it is published by the UN and, and uh, they, are, uh, take, they are taken as inputs by a lot of uh, countries or uh, organization. And so, for instance, here at the university, they take as input uh, this, this goal to achieve, uh, to, to make plans and to achieve them. So here you have all the goals. So for instance, uh, no poverty. So end poverty in all its form and everywhere. And then they are, uh, they, you have the subdivision into that goal. So you can have uh, more information here. You have zero hunger, good health and well-being. So you can see that it is here about uh, social uh, indicators, quality education, gender equality, clean water and uh, sanitation, affordable and clean energy. So this one concerns more energy, decent work, Industry innovation infrastructure, reduce inequalities, sustainable city and communities, responsible consumption and production patterns, climate action. So this one concerns climate, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and, and what? And strong institution, partnership for the goal book. Okay, so this one is not that one. And so you can see that in sustainable goal, according to the UN. It's not, it's not only about the environment, but you have a lot of goals that, that are only related to, to the, the human being, in fact. You can have a look at this video. Sur HD. Ah. Does it surprise you that uh, there are so many goals that are not directly related to the environment? Is it a surprise for you? Or not? And so we have quality education. So here in Belgium, of course, we have a good education, but it's not uh, the case in, uh, in many countries. And it is uh, pointed by, for instance, by the IPCC report as one of uh, the main leverage 
to, to tackle the climate change because, of course, if you have educated people about the topic, it's much more easier to, to take action. If you don't know anything about climate change, it's impossible to do something. So, so it's, it's quite logical that education uh, here uh, is there. But for instance, gender equality also, because if, if you treat uh, differently uh, women and men, uh, can be uh, difficult. And for instance, when we talk about population and the way to, to, to control population on Earth, it has been shown that uh, most of the time when uh, women are edu well educated, they have less children than when they are not educated. And so it is also pointed out by the IPCC report, for instance, and one way to, to address the climate change. Because of course, if we have uh, 40 billion on Earth or 10 billion on Earth, it's not the same. Okay, so the perimeter of the course, because of, of course in that, uh, that, that course we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, study all uh, the, the sustainable development goals, it would be impossible. And that course is not designed for that. It is mainly designed uh, to address the climate, uh, climate issue and the energy issue, but uh, in a rather uh, large uh, manner, because I, in the energy issue, I include also raw materials, ICT and so on. But uh, we will not address, uh, for instance, quality education, gender equality, and so on, etc. But with the climate and digital college, I will provide you two tools, in fact, to educate people. So it is also a little bit re re related to quality education, but more in the sense to provide you some tools that can educate people about uh, this uh, issue. So if then, then on the website, you can see there are some information about uh, each, uh, each goal. And so, for instance, if we take uh, the climate change, they, uh, they, uh, they put some information. And so they, they say that, uh, for instance, if we want to, 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 to limit the global warming to 1.5 degree, uh, we, would, uh, we should decrease our emissions uh, each year uh, by 7.5%. Of course, it is not the case, but that should be uh, what we, we are supposed uh, to do. And so you have some key information about, uh, about that. And so for instance, it is quite uh, interesting. I don't know if you can see it. But during the, the COVID crisis, uh, of course, we were uh, all at home. So most of the people were not using uh, car anymore or play and so on. And so the transportation, uh, the transportation that uh, emits a lot of CO2 emission was not emitting, emitting a CO2 emission. And it resulted in a 6% drop in greenhouse gas emission. And so it's quite, uh, for, for me, in my opinion, it is quite uh, impressive that even the COVID-19 COVID crisis, where we almost did nothing because we were at home, it was not enough to reduce emission as uh, what we are supposed to do and just for one year. Meaning we, we should be doing that every year. So it's every year an additional drop of six or 7%. And the COVID crisis was only approximately one year. And, we're, and we were like all at home and we, we are not doing anything. So it's a very difficult problem. And so we can see that it is not only related to transportation, in fact. Because even if we were at home, we all have energy to, to power our house computer and so on, but we also have food, etc. The industry and companies, they were working. And so we have a lot of CO2 emissions that are not related to transportation. So I already uh, asked you that one. Do you know the IPCC? Uh, and so Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Uh, you have a, a nice, uh, do you know Le Réveilleur? You know Réveilleur? And do you know Réveilleur? Uh, Le, Le Réveilleur, it's, it's uh, so on YouTube you have everything, of course. And so one uh, of the, also in, in that course, I, I will provide you several uh, sources of information. Sometimes it will be completely scientific information. So for instance, the IPCC, but sometimes it will not be uh, scientific information, but from some people that I think that can be uh, interesting. And I think that Le Réveilleur is one of them but uh, 
you can have a look uh, on his uh, website on, on YouTube. He made a lot of video about a different topic on energy, climate, and so on. And he made uh, a special video on how works the IPCC and its reports. And so it's quite well described to understand uh, what is the purpose of the IPCC, why there are uh, different kind of report, technical summary, etc., and how and how they are uh, organized. And so this summer we have the release of the of the last report, the AR6 Climate Change 2021, and uh, it is uh, some in, in the media they, they talk uh, about it, but but not so much in fact. So may, maybe they will uh, talk more because we have there, there is another event uh, in a few months, but uh, it was released so by, by the first working group. And it is a most up-to-date physical understanding of the climate system and climate change. And so it is uh, freely, uh, freely accessible. So here on the, on the IPCC website, you, you, have, uh, you have all the information. And uh, each time that the IPCC releases a report, you have a summary uh, for policymakers. And I, I strongly encourage you to have a look at this one because the full report is like 1,000 uh, pages. So it's a... Uh, uh, it's impossible to read uh, that amount of information, but they always make uh, a summary for policymaker. And most of the time it is like between 20 and 40 pages. And it is very well uh, designed to just uh, grasp the key information. And it is supposed uh, to be made for the decision makers, if uh, they read it, of course. It's, a, it's a, something else. And so it provides a high level summary of the understanding of the current state of the climate, climate, and we have a look at it. And so, for instance, in, in, uh, in that report, in the last report, they say it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere have occurred. So, right now, they can say we almost 100% with a prob almost a probability of one that climate change is due to, to, to human activity. But uh, for instance, uh, when they released the first report, it was in nine, maybe 30 years ago, there was not enough scientific evidence to say that global warming was due to human activity. And so at that time, they said, they say, we don't know. There is like, it's like, it was like 50-50. We cannot say it is not human activity, but we cannot say it is human activity. But at that time, there was not so many scientific publications of that topic. I know there, they have, there is so many publications that there is a, a consensus in the scientific community that say, okay, you cannot say that is not related to human activity. So now people, and it, it still exists, there are still people that say, no, it's not related to human activity, it's a natural phenomena. The, IP, the IPCC say, okay, no, no. You cannot debate about that. There are, there are some facts now. And, and here, so this is how it looks. A summary, uh, summary report. So here you have all the author. We don't, we don't care. Okay. So you have se several chapters. So here, for instance, the first one is about the current state of the climate. And so they, ex they explain uh, the improvements since the last report. So the AR5, it was released like it's, it's, each report is released every six or seven years. It's a cycle of reports. And now they are able to better simulate the evolution of the climate and so also the consequences. And so then you have several statements that, that it is uh, uh, designed for the decision maker that are designed for decision makers. But what I really like in that, in, to that report, it is the figures. Because uh, it's e really easy to understand uh, the figures. So here, for instance, you have the, the change in global surface temperature. It is an annual average. And so it is in, in a degree. And here you have the observed uh, temperature in black. And here you have simu simulation with human and natural factors. And here you have the simulation with only natural factors. And so you can see that if you do not include the human activity, you cannot reproduce the temperature that we observe. 
into the data. And so this is how they conclude that the human activity is responsible for the global warming. And so you can see that on average, right now, we have an average of 1.2 degree. So we have 1.2 degree more than, uh, than uh, the average temperature over the last century. And so the, the major increase was during the last 50 years. But 1.2 degree, uh, I don't know for you, but it's like, for me, uh, at the beginning, I was, okay, 1.2 degree, okay. It's not so much, it's not, that, not so much 1.2 degree. But you, you, you can, it's very important uh, to understand that climate and weather, it's completely different. So if we have a look at the temperature today, it is a weather, but during the day, the temperature will fluctuate maybe between, uh, between the morning and, the, and the, the, the lunchtime. Sometimes you have 10 degrees of difference. So 1.2 degree between 10 degrees, it's not, it's not that much. But here, when, we are, when they talk about one degree, it is an annual average, so over the entire year and over the entire Earth. And so it means that there are some places that it is less and some places that it is more, but on average, you, you have 1.2 more. And the oceans that are composed of water are, uh, are less uh, hotter than the land. And in fact, on land, maybe you will have on average two or three degrees more. And in North Pole and the South Pole, it, is, it has increased much more. So sometimes it is five or six degrees more. And it explained that, that most of the time you have more frequent events with uh, uh, can you call extreme weather event with very, very hot temperature. And here we have also the trend, but over uh, more, uh, more year. And so you can see that uh, the, the average temperature on Earth has always fluctuated over the last uh, centuries, but the, the warming is unprecedented uh, the last 50 years, the last 100 years. But then you have also other, uh, other uh, graphics. I will, I will look it di directly on the reports. It's easier to see it. Maybe it will be difficult for you to, to read it. I will try to, to comment it. Here it is, in fact, the, the contribution to, to the global warming. So in red, here you have all the greenhouse uh, gases. And so they say that the contribution of all the greenhouse gases would be up to 1.5 degree. But we have observed 1.2 degree or 1.1. And it is because in fact, we have other human activities. And so you have the greenhouse gases, but you have also other factors that have the, the other effect that will cool the climate. And so the, the, the sum of uh, both factors leads to 1.1 degree of average. And so in, into the simulation, they take into account all the factors. And so the most famous greenhouse gases greenhouse gases is of course the carbon dioxide, but you have also methane. And then you have also other ones which are less famous and which accounts for less uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, global warming. But the CO2 is around 0.8 degree and methane 0.5. So it accounts for almost all the, the global warming. But you have also, for instance, sulfur dioxide that are released uh, by, uh, by the cars. And in fact, it, it has the uh, exact opposite effect. Instead of warming the climate, it cools the climate. But so you, you could say, oh, it's cool. <laughs> it, it is cooling the climate. So it's great. We should release more of this one. But uh, it is uh, polluting the atmosphere in other ways. So you can, you can suffer from disease and because you have the very small particles. So they have other effects that are not desirable des for, for health. But they, in terms of warming, it can, it, uh, it's a little bit, uh, it, it, it cools the climate. So we, without them, the, the global warming would be uh, even higher. But so the IPCC takes into account uh, everything. This, this, map, this map is quite nice. In fact, they, they say that climate change is already affecting every inhabited region across the globe. Because sometimes we think that, okay, probably uh, 
there is a global warming. It's, it's okay. It's, it's sure we have 1.2 degree, but it does not really affect us right now. But in, it is not the case. They have observed with data that already on almost all, uh, all area of the world, we have uh, some, uh, some effect of this global warming. And so here, uh, for instance, we have uh, Europe, but also North America. For the legend, it will be easier into the report. Okay. So it means the type of observed change in hot extremes. So here we have an increase of hot extreme in almost all rich area of the world. So including Europe, but also other parts of the world with confidence in human contributions high. So it means that they are not 100% sure, but they are pretty sure that uh, the, these observe uh, extreme events are uh, due to the to human, uh, human activities. And I am pretty sure that uh, you have all uh, observed that during the last decade, we have had a lot of extreme hotter events during the summer, but not this year. So this year is uh, completely different in terms of temperature, but the other years of the, the last decade, there was always a very uh, hot extreme event. But it is not only about temperature. So here it is about hot extremes, but we have also in heavy precipitation. And here also, they say that uh, in terms of heavy precipitation, in uh, many areas of the world, they have observed very extreme event with a high confidence, including Europe, but not only Europe. And this year, so you cannot, you cannot conclude the, but so you have all heard about the flooding here at Liege, but also in Germany, you cannot conclude in terms of uh, scientists cannot say it is one with 100% uh, probability related to the climate change, you cannot say that. But they can say that st statistically, this type, this type of extreme events will occur much more and they are occurring much more frequently than before. So you cannot say that this year it is due to that, but it is pretty related to climate change. And you have also in terms of agricultural and ecological droughts. And so right now Europe is not concerned, but there are some parts of the world where there has been an increase of observed change in agricultural and ecological droughts. And these changes has been observed since the 1950s. So it is not into the future, it is right now, even with only, only 1.2 degrees uh, of, uh, of warming. So these 1.2 degrees might seem not so much, but in fact, on average, it's huge. This picture is also nice, we'll have a look at it. So now we are going into the second chapter, into the future. So the first one was about the present and the consequences here in the, the present. Now it is into the future, chapter B. Okay, yeah. Okay, so these are the projected changes in extremes in terms of frequency and intensity with every additional increment of global run. So here you have the 10 year event and the 50 year event in terms of hot temperature extremes of the land. So it means that before uh, uh, global warming, you already have uh, you already had a 10 years event or 50 year event. It, it, it was very hot summer and it happened uh, once in 10 years or once in 50 years. And so it is a reference. Right now, by, uh, by taking into account the 1.1, 1.2 degree, these events that occur only once every 10 years or 15 years now occurs almost three times 
more frequently for the 10 year event and five times uh, more frequently with the 50 years event. So it's quite a huge increase in fact. And, and th this is why, in fact, when we think about an average temperature, it, it does not reflect these, these types of events because the average, most of the time it's okay, it's like uh, before, but you have much more frequent events for one week or two, it's very, very hot. Imagine with 1.5 degrees, it is now 4.1 times more for the 10 years event and 8.6 times uh, more for, one, for uh, the 50 years event. And so you can see that with an increase of 0 0.5 degrees, it, it is not an increase of 50%. It is not a linear effect. And this is a very important to have that in mind. It is not a linear rela relationship between the evolution of temperature and the extreme events. Because most of the time, the decision maker, they think with a linear relationship. If something increases by two, the effect will increase by two. And here, this is very, something very important to understand. In terms of climate, it is nonlinear. So if the temperature increases uh, by a factor two, probably the, the effects will not increase by a factor two. Maybe it will be three times more, maybe four times more, maybe it will be a factor four. It is nonlinear because the system, the Earth system is nonlinear. And this is very, very important to have that in mind. But maybe it will be less. Maybe it will be not two times uh, worse. Maybe it will only uh, it will be the same. But you cannot say it is a linear relationship. But according to the simulation of the IPCC, so if we reach uh, a global warming of two degrees, and now two degrees is the target uh, that is uh, that are supposed to achieve the the, the countries. So the Paris Agreement where uh, okay. The, they put the 1.5 degree target as a kind of advertisement, but uh, the action that were taken into account could not be able to reach uh, that target. So now it is more like two degrees. And even if we, if we reach two degrees, it's quite fine. But so even with two degrees, so 50 years events will occur 14 times uh, more frequently than, uh, than, with, uh, than before. And now it is five, five times. So you can see that it has not doubled. Here we, it, it, it's almost three times more. And on average, you can see the intensity of this uh, extreme uh, event in terms of degree. And so you can see that if you have an extreme hot event with, uh, so if before you had, for instance, an extreme uh, weather event with uh, 40 degrees, maybe it will be 45. So it's quite a lot in my opinion. And so you have uh, the same thing for the uh, heavy precip precipitation of our land. And so you can see that with the global warming, it will also increase uh, the, the, the heavy precipitation of the land. So it is less, it is less than uh, the temperature, but there are some parts of, the, of the, the earth that will be concerned at that. And it is a problem because it does not mean that you will have less water on average on Earth, but it means that in some places they will have more water, but in one time. And in some places they will have less water. And if you have uh, no water for uh, several months, uh, suddenly you have a lot of water, the, the soil cannot absorb uh, the water. It's a problem for the agri agricultural. And uh, so that's why in some, in some area it will be difficult also. What do you think in fact about that? Uh, have you already heard about uh, these things or, or not? Actually, because when we so when we heard into the media about IPCC, the, in fact, it is what they are talking into the reports. It is this kind of figures, but in my opinion, they it is not really reflected into the media. They always they only say it is a global warming of one, two, or three degrees. But it does not reflect, in fact, the, the impact in terms of extreme uh, extreme events, because the problem is the extreme events. It's not uh, it's not the daily life, in fact. Okay. And one thing which is about, I think you, uh, you, you know that, that is every ton of CO2 emission adds to global warming. 
And so here, in fact, you have so this this curve. Here it is a, the the average temperature on Earth, the average annual surface temperature on Earth, and here you have the CO2 emissions, so the cumulative CO2 emissions since uh, pre-industrial uh, since the pre-industrial uh, area era, sorry, in uh, in gigaton. And so here it is the historical global warming. So here we are we are here uh, 1.1, 1.2 degree. And so we have already released around uh, more than uh, 2,000 gigaton of CO2 emission in terms of, uh, of cumulative emission. And here you have, in fact, several indicators. So the blue one, it, they are all uh, future scenario in terms of CO2 emission. So the first one means that we will uh, release again like 1,000 gigaton of CO2, but it will limit the emission to two degrees. So it is a scenario that enables to limit the, 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 the average uh, increase of temperature up to two degrees. So that should be the scenario that ideally we should follow if we want to limit uh, the global increase up to two degrees. So we can only release, again, 1,000 of gigaton CO2 emission. But then if we release more that we will, uh, we will uh, outreach the two degree and so on and so on, and so here is a, the three degree scenario. So if we double the emission in terms of cumulative emission, it means that we will reach three degree. And it is important to understand that each ton, each ton of CO2 is important. It means that even if it can look, uh, can look like, okay, uh, it's not so important. If we only decrease CO2 emission by 10%, it's, it's not enough. Yes, okay, it's true, but it will still be good because it limits a little bit uh, the increase in terms of temperature. So it's, a, it's very important to understand that each 0 0.1 degree is important because some people say sometimes, oh yes, uh, 1.2 or 1.5 or two, uh, it's the same. No, 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 it, it's, not, it's not the same because in terms of effect, as it is nonlinear, it's always good if to limit even with 0 0.1 degrees, uh, it's, it's already a victory in, term, in that case. And so you have almost a linear relationship between the CO2 emission and the, the temperature, the increase in terms of temperature. And so into the last report, they have raised something that is nice. It is a kind of uh, atlas. So here you can see the earth and you can simulate a possible uh, climate future. So for instance, with 1.5 degree on average, on all earth. And so you can see that there are some part of the globe of the, uh, of the earth that are more more uh, affected, so the North Pole, but also some other area. And you can see also in terms of precipitation. So it is 1.5, you can put two degree, three degree, four degree, and also the temperature. And then you, you can see more uh, refined information. So here you have the map. So this is a scatter plot. Um, uh, you can, so yes, so you can select, so here it is a mean temperature, but you, you have also other vari variables. So you have a uh, different, uh, so you, you can have a look at the total precipitation or the snowfall, surface wind, etc. Here you have uh, the, the, the degree, but I would like to have a look on Belgium. Region North America, no, 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 no. no. Ah. no. Okay, I cannot have a look only on Belgium. I wanted to have a look only on Belgium. But, uh... but what is interesting is to see that on land, the, the, the increase of thermal temperature is different because with a warming of 1.5 degree, in fact, it is an average increase of two degrees on land because the, 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 the oceans are less, uh, does not absorb the temperature uh, on, the, on the same way than on land. 
But so for warming of two degrees, in fact, it is 2.7 on average. So it means that the extreme events are much more extreme on the land than on, on the ocean. And here, for instance, in the North Pole, you can see that a warming of 1.5 degrees, it is on average 3.5 degrees. A warming of two degrees is 4.9 degrees. And so you can see that uh, all part, uh, all the region of the, the Earth are not concerned uh, equally by the increase of temperature. And maybe you have heard of the, um, I don't know how to say that, les incendies, le, the firing, um, big fire work, but I don't know how to say that in English, but you know, in, uh, in, um, in Siberia, uh, it was not that year, that year it was Canada, but I think it was last year they, they, they uh, reached uh, extreme event like it was almost 40 degree temperature in, uh, almost uh, at the, close to the North Pole. And they, they have never seen that because in that part of the, of the, of the earth, the uh, global warming is much more uh, severe than uh, other area of, uh, of the earth. And so you can see that on that map, uh, you can have a look. but also in terms of uh, flooding, precipitation, and so on. So they made uh, a lot of work into that mm -hmm. last report to try to illustrate uh, the, the global, uh, the global warming, the climate change. To illustrate that, there are also nice uh, picture here. So here you can see the carbon budgets, and here the CO2 concentration into the atmosphere, the global mean temperature, and it is uh, uh, recorded historical data. So it starts at the pre-industrial pre era up to now. And so here you have the 1.5 degree budget, and here's the two degree budget in terms of CO2. And so you can see here how it is uh, increasing, and here you have the CO2 concentration, and here the average uh, in context. And so you can see that we are here approximately. So we only have uh, one third of that uh, budget that is remaining to limit the global warming up to 1.5 degrees. And here it is a CO2 concentration in terms of PPM. And here you can see the evolution of the global mean temperature by, uh, by month. And so you can see that it is not uh, equally increasing uh, inside the year, but on average, for each month of the year, the, the average temperature on Earth is increasing. And so the idea of course is to limit uh, the global warming uh, up to 1.5 degrees, even if most of the, the experts say it will be very, very difficult, but the two degree limit is still uh, reachable. I've also here some, uh, but so we can see that it's really in the last 50 years that it will increase uh, suddenly. And so here you can see the COVID. <laughs> but here it is the yearly CO2 emission. So it does not mean uh, that during the COVID crisis, the CO2 uh, emission just, it just means that you, you, you have to, to think that the CO2 emission stays into the atmosphere. So it does not disappear like that. It will take decades to disappear. So it means that during the COVID period, we just re released a little bit less of CO2 than the year before, but we still release a lot of CO2 uh, emission. Here it is an illustration of the temperature anomaly uh, relative to the, here, not, not to the pre-industrial era, but to, to, the, to this uh, time period. 
And here you can see that uh, the, the temperature has uh, really increased uh, much more into, uh, in the North Pole, but also on land. But in some area of the globe, of the Earth, it was a little bit less. On average, the temperature has increased, but you can see that in some places, it is an increase of almost five, five, five or six or seven degrees. Okay. Do you want to make a short break or, uh, or is it still okay? Because I, I, I still have a lot of subjects, so, so I, I will make a break on the presentation, but if you feel that we can make it now, if you want, that's your wish. Or we can still uh, take a few slides and after we can It's okay. Slide. What, what do you think of the current policies and the climate target? You want to a few words? So we have seen a little bit some figures of the IPCC. So it seems that we have a climate change issue. It seems that we have some targets to achieve if we want to, to limit uh, the, the global warming up to 1.5 or 2 degrees. And uh, what, of what you have heard into the media or maybe of the lectures, what do you think of the current I think there are not really um, efficient policies that are taken. Uh, well, I just feel like we, we know uh, there is climate change and we know it's bad and it's getting even worse. But we are like, yes, we should do something, but we don't really do something. So maybe a, a kind of gap between the rhetoric, what is said, and maybe the action. Yes, but I I don't feel like we are uh, concerned as we should be. We are not enough concerned by by yeah. that. I feel like uh, it's always a problem for the future, and we don't want. And the leads now, so we wait to take a little bit of policies, but not effective policies that make a change. Okay. Thank you for your opinion. I don't have the feeling that we are uh, always taking uh, good decisions. For example, for the electricity production, particularly in Western Europe. I have the feeling that we want, for example, to put away the nuclear energy a bit too fast. There was a, yes, in Western Europe, a lot of people um, don't want any more uh, nuclear energy. I mean, I think that, for example, this is a, a mistake because we are partner for, for climate. Yeah. So, like, we, we want to do the climate change to be, to be better, but we don't want to change uh, the way of the world. Mm -hmm. So, if we don't make any effort, uh, like uh, the gas uh, the airplane or things like that, we won't uh, achieve to do better. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. 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 Also, yes. Thank you for, for that sharing. So it comes from the website, our world in, in data. You have a lot of data about everything. So if you want to have a look, you, you, you can have it. And here about climate change, and it is a link. So when you have the PDF, you can click. In. And here it is uh, some data about climate change and CO2 and gaps. And here you have the annual global greenhouse gas emission in terms of gigaton of, uh, of CO2 emissions. What is released, uh, what has been released, and what uh, should be released according to some uh, scenario. And according to them, with the current policy, so what uh, decision makers say they are going to do, it is not what, what they are doing. What is they are, so, for instance, the Paris Agreement in uh, 2015. In fact, even with that, if we do everything that is planned into that current policies, 
the global warming will still be between like, let's say two and three degrees. And if we do no climate policy, it will be much more worse. And so, but so you can see that in fact, to follow the 1.5 degree uh, pathway. So if we want to limit the global warming up to 1.5 degrees, so the, the CO2 emission would should, should be something like this. So it should be decreasing right now, drastically uh, up to zero in fact. But if we follow the current policy, it is not the case. So it, it seems to follow a little bit what uh, you share. And another source, because our world is data is maybe not, uh, it's not a scientific source, but uh, here you have the UN CO2 gap report. So it's quite serious, the UN. And even the UN say into a report that is named CO2 gap report. So you have several pages on this, the gap between rhetoric and action. Here you have the, the, the CO2 emission. Here you have the, the policy. So if we just do the business as usual here, the gray, the, the gray is business as usual. So before taking any uh, policy about climate change, you, you still uh, keep on uh, increasing the CO2 emission. But if you follow the current policy scenario where they say that they are taking into account all, that, uh, all, the, all the targets, it is still increasing pretty much. And so you can see that if you want to follow, in fact, uh, pathways to reach 1.5 or 1.8 or 2 degrees, you will need to decrease the emission. So it seems to say that the current policy are not uh, in line uh, with the targets. Even if in the Paris Agreement, and especially uh, France, <laughs> they say, "Way, 1.5 degrees, great, it's right. Yes, but it was more rhetoric, unfortunately, than uh, reality uh, in terms of uh, action. And so you can have a look on the UN CO2 uh, gap report. It is a, a very serious uh, a report. And so it is in French, but also in English. But here, for instance, is uh, the report in English. And so they release a report, I think it is each year, it is a report that uh, comments uh, the gap between uh, the policies and, uh, and, the, and the, the action. It, it takes some time. Here it is uh, the same picture, but with, uh, it is the same information, with, but with a, a different picture. Here you have the Paris Agreement goal. That is 1.5 degree. And so we are here between 1.5, 1.2 degree, depends, but almost uh, that one. And so you can see that we, are, we still have a 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degree up to, to reach that limit. But if we follow the current policies, it seems that we would achieve an increase in terms of temperature between two and four degree. And so we, you have the optimist target if maybe we, we, we try to, to, to really limit uh, increase come hello hello again you come back for the gap between uh, rhetoric and action about uh, co2 emission so you you will see on the video but we are, have have some slide about the last uh, ipcc uh, reports okay. to depict some uh, effects of the climate change and now we are talking about uh, the gap between uh, current policy and the targets to achieve the limits of 1.5 or 2 degree in terms of the one them. And so according to them, unfortunately, if we follow the current policy, it would be very, very difficult to, to achieve the, the limit of 1.5, even impossible. It will be like more three degree. The report, I would like to show you the report so quickly. So it is quite a big report. So here it is uh, the, the last one released in 2020, the emissions gap report 2020. And so they depict you the global emission trends, the emission gap. And so they also talk about the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on the CO2 emission, how to bridge the gap, and so they provide some uh, some guidelines to, 
to try to, 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 to bridge that gap between rhetoric and action. But of course, it's always the same thing at the end. It has, there, there, there need to be actions. It cannot be only uh, rhetoric. These pictures also depict that trend. Uh, if we follow the business as usual emission, it is still increasing in terms of global uh, CO2 emission and also in terms of uh, temperature. And here, in fact, you can see that which one is quite interesting. You have natural climate solution to address uh, the climate issue. It means that, for instance, uh, reforestation. Uh, I don't know uh, if you, uh, you are aware of that, but right now we are more in a trend of deforestation than reforestation. So we do not see that here in Europe because we, are, we have already, in fact, uh, get rid of our major forest. And so now it is stable and we are protecting the last remaining area of forest. But for instance, in some country where you have a, a lot of forest so in uh, South America, so for instance, I'm pretty sure that you have heard of that, that there is a, a trend uh, for deforestation. And it represents uh, globally each year an amount of between 10 and 50% of all the CO2 emission. So each year, because we are burning uh, forests, it represents an amount of 10 and 15% of the CO2 emission. So of course, if we do the uh, opposite effect and we reforest some part of the earth, including Europe, and not only uh, the, the other part of the earth, it, it can be a way to help to, 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 to do the job, but not only. And so with all the natural climate solution, including reforestation, but not only, you can maybe achieve, you can see uh, what we have to do, maybe 10 or 20% of what we can do, but most of the job, in fact, will be done by reducing our consumption of uh, fuel energy. Because uh, I think you, you know that the CO2 emissions are mainly released by uh, oil, gas, uh, oil, gas, and, and, coal. and so this is a big problem here. It is a fossil fuel mitigation. And this is where uh, it is the most uh, difficult part uh, of the job it is how can we achieve the same uh, way of life? But is it possible to have the same way of life? Like even if we would like to have the same way of life, how can we do it with much more or less uh, fossil energy? And right now, unfortunately, it is not the case. Even if uh, we have a decision maker have said now maybe for a decade or two decades that they are doing and uh, taking action to do that, when we have a look and on the way we live and on the CO2 emission, it is not. These pictures uh, show you uh, the inequalities uh, in terms of CO2 emission um, between, in fact, the, 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 the poor and the, and the rich. And uh, in fact, CO2 emission is not something that is equally uh, shared uh, among, uh, all, uh, all, among all people on, uh, on Earth. Uh, the 1%, 1 of the people that have the more, uh, that has a, that has a more rich on Earth uh, amounts for a, a large part of the CO2 emissions. And here you have the 10% of the people that are uh, that have all the that are the, the richest on earth in fact they are known for uh, 40 52 percent of the co2 emission so the the first uh the seal in terms of uh, financial uh, power they are known for half of the co2 emission and the one percent for 15 percent and so you can see that, in fact, uh, half of the population amounts only for 7% of the CO2 emission. So it's something also uh, that needs to be taken into account because, because uh, sometimes uh, you can uh, hear some discussion or some people that say, yes, but you know, in some country, they, 
there are too many uh, I mean, four country or some country, yes, but in fact, they are so, so poor that they amount for almost nothing in terms of CO2 emission in comparison with country, for instance, United States, Belgium, France, and so on, where on average, we are more like here, on average, or here. And, and so rich country, in fact, it means that rich country amounts for uh, the largest part of the CO2 emissions. And so it, it also means that the efforts to tackle climate change should not be equally uh, shared between countries. It means that rich countries have much more effort to do to get rid of the fuel fuel energy. Did you know that? Does it surprise you or, or not? In fact, it's quite logical because if you have access of a lot of things, like uh, if it's easy to take a plane, if it's easy to build a house, if it's easy to drive a car, if it's easy to have a uh, to buy, to buy a computer or everything else. Of course, behind that, we do not see that, but you have fuel cell energy. So it's quite logical, in fact, the, the more money you have, the easier it is to buy a lot of things and to do a lot of things, but you do not see the CO2 emission, but of course there are CO2 emissions behind that. So it's quite logical. It's not, a, it has not to be taken like, oh, as a rich, they are bad. No, no, not at all, I am not saying that, it just, of course, if you have a good way of life, it's easier to have access to a lot of services. And unfortunately, a lot of these services rely mainly on fossil energy. And so what do you think of climate change and social inequalities? Now that we know that we, we have uh, inequalities between the CO2 emission, and so we have also social inequalities. What do you think between climate change and social inequalities? They are linked, yes. To succeed to bring a better life, a better social level of life, social level of quality of life. Yes, a way of life, quality of life, I understand it. To do a lot of and maybe uh, according to the, the previous graph, the more you are rich, more you pay more. So, uh, there, there is some strange thing. If you live better, yeah. you, you just pay more, you are very less. And so, yes. you are, uh, I, should, I should be poor. But it's difficult. We can, nobody wants to be poor, and it is not the goal at all. Yes, yes. yes. That's a bit strange. That's a bit strange. And uh, if you remember into the, the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, it was one, uh, one of them was to eradicate poverty. So it is, of course, not the goal to be uh, all poor. We do not want to be all poor. We, we, and I think it is a, a right for every human being to have a, a good quality of life. And, uh, so so, so the, the key challenge is now, OK, right now our society is based on fossil energy. And so the key challenge is how can we change that so that we can uh, provide a good way of life for everybody, but not only into rich country, but also, also into other countries. And of course, to decrease the CO2 emission. You wanted to add something? So here it is. Uh, it is a cumulative uh, CO2 emission that has been released, released since uh, pre-industrial era. So here you have a look because it, it, it's quite nice to have the, this uh, picture because sometimes when I discuss that with people, they say, "Ah, oh, that is now you know here in European country and United States, it's okay, we we have taken action." It is in China the problem, but if you have a look at the cumulative CO2 emission. Uh, you can see that North America uh, amounts only uh, amounts I mean, sorry amounts for almost one third of the global cumulative CO2 emission, and USA amounts for one quarter of the world. So it's quite uh, it's quite huge, huge. European uh, Europe it amounts for twenty two percent. So if 
uh, we take into account North America and Europe, we are at uh, half of the cumulative uh, CO2 emission that have been uh, released. And Asia is uh, 30% and China amounts for 13%. So it is true that right now, China is emitting a lot of CO2 emission. But if you take into account the global picture and uh, you, you count the cumulative CO2 emission, the rich country still amounts for a very, very large part of the, the global emission. So, so, you, so it's, you cannot say, okay, uh, now they are releasing a lot of CO2 emission no, and it is okay for us now. It, it means that it's much more complicated than that. And we all have uh, to make, uh, all country have to make a lot of efforts about it. But it's quite incredible to see, for instance, Africa, it is 3% of the global emission. So South America, 3% and Oceania, 1.2. So it's completely uh, not uh, equally shared between, uh, between, uh, between country or, or continents. But the thing is that the problem is global. So even if you are a country that uh, achieved to decrease a lot its CO2 emission, the problem is that if your neighbor doesn't care, you will be impacted. And that's why it is also a very complicated problem it is because we are not alone. We are all in the same, all in the same game, but it is not a only a technical uh, problem. Otherwise, it would, it would have been already solved. The problem is it is also, it brings economical issue, political issue, and a psychological issue. Uh, <laughs> So we, we, we can talk about uh, social inequality, but also in terms of social inequality, it can be also uh, inequality between generations. Uh, so this, uh, this figure uh, shows um, the, life, the lifetime carbon budget. It means that if uh, you were born at the beginning of the precedent century, you would have had a carbon uh, budget of uh, 200 of tons over your entire year. But if you were born just after the Second World War, where we have had in the rich country uh, a rapid economical growth, you would have had uh, a budget carbon more than 300 ton. But if now we follow the pathways to limit the, the global warming up to 1.5 or 2 degrees, it means, of course, that we need to decrease uh, the lifetime carbon budget for every person, it is, it is logic. But some people could say, okay, but yes, but uh, it means that I will uh, have to make much more effort than my uh, parents or grandparents or the people before me. So it's unfair in fact. But yes, it is unfair. And it is true, it is unfair because if we want to reach uh, the, the targets, it means that we have to decrease the CO2 emission. So it means that we have to decrease our uh, carbon budget and at the end to decrease it uh, drastically. So it means that the last generations, so the one that were born last year or, the, or five years ago, it means that if you, if you have a look at the expected lifetime carbon budget, they should be uh, almost no, 1.5 times less than the one who were born uh, in, 90, in the 90s uh, centuries. And so me, for instance, I was born in 1988, so maybe somewhere here. So depending on the limit that uh, we would achieve, I would be there or there. And you were born when? 20, 25 years ago now, 23 years ago, 22 years ago. So somewhere there, just before uh, 2000. So you are here, so you are, uh, according to that, I have a life carbon budget of uh, 10 or 20 tons more. So it's completely unfair, in fact, if you, have a, if you look at it like that. And so one of the key challenge is how to bring a good quality of light without this carbon. Because if we are able to do that, in fact, it's not a problem to reduce uh, the, the carbon budget. The problem is that if you reduce your carbon budget, you, you, you will not access to the same quality of life. It is unfair, of course. Uh, it's difficult to say that countries uh, which want to develop 
Yes, yes. And it is much more difficult when uh, they can say, oh, but the look at you. Look at your cumulative emission and uh, your economic growth. I, I would like to have uh, the same economic growth. And so you have already uh, polluted. So why not me? And that, that, that is also one of the big challenges, how to achieve an economical and social uh, growth without emitting uh, CO2. Uh, that, was a, that is a quite a, a big challenge. This one or this one? Yes, it's starting from, uh, from the pre-industrial era. It's a cumulative. Uh, and it didn't take into account the maximum degradation of the CO2. I, I, I don't think so. They just say, okay, you have emitted uh, this amount of CO2 and this is like that. But it, it, it's a question that you maybe you, you will ask to Xavier Fedvice when, when he will come. It is how much time uh, does the uh, greenhouse gas stays into the atmosphere? And it is a very, very long time. Unfortunately, it is a very long time, and that's why it's a big problem. In fact, because if the CO2 would only remain for ten for ten years, okay, uh, we, we will not have that problem. Should wait about uh, 10,000 years. Yes, it's, it's very, very long. Oh. Uh, at, at, at the human scale, it is not reversible. Meaning human scale, like uh, not million years, but like uh, 1,000 years, 2,000 years. It's, it's, it's a very big problem. And even if we stop right now, imagine right now we press the button, you stop right now to, to emit CO2 emission. So there will still be effects. On the, on the climate change because it's, you have inertia into the system. And so once, for instance, you have started to melt some ice into, for instance, the Greenland or North Pole, it is an irreversible process that will keep on going for hundreds of years. So even if we stop right now, there will still be consequences for hundreds of years. But of course, it's, it is still even better than uh, keep on going. Because some people say, okay, even if we start now, it will be uh, it will be something uh, catastrophic. So it's impossible to no, no. But if you, you do not stop now, it will be even worse. So the thing is, how can we, uh, in terms like uh, to soften the impact? In fact, to try to decrease the impact and to get more time to adapt. And one way of uh, addressing this issue it is not only to limit the CO2 emission, but it is also to change the way of life to adapt. So it will mean to, to, to live differently, maybe with different way of life or different areas to adapt to these changes. It will be the future. We will have to adapt. There's a question? Ah, yes, it is a CO2 emission by sector. Uh, so it, it was by sector from 19. Okay, so it should be, yeah, so it is a CO2 emission by sector. So you have uh, electricity and heat that amounts for almost one quarter of the CO2 emission. Then you have the industry, transportation, buildings. And this one, I don't know what it means, AFOU. Okay. But, okay, about this one, electricity and heat, it is quite logical because most of the heat on Earth is uh, done by gas. You just burn gas uh, to heat. And so, of course, it is so emission. And for the electricity, uh, probably you already know, but uh, I will ask you the question. What do you think is the first uh, primary source of energy to produce energy? You would say coal, from a gas from nuclear, at the world scale, at the world scale, at the world scale, not in Belgium. Coal, coal too, yes, yes, 
Coal is the first pri primary source of energy to produce electricity at the world scale. It is true that in European countries now, most of the European countries have decreased the use of coal. But if you had a look, uh, I think maybe 30 years or 40 years ago, it was not uh, decreased. And coal, in fact, is most of the time used to produce electricity. And why is that? It is because it is a, a solid, so it is heavy. So it costs you energy to transport it from one way to another way, uh, from one point to another point, sorry. So from a, an economical aspect, uh, you do not transport coal, except if uh, you really have to use it, for instance, uh, I don't know if you have a, a chemical process, an industrial process that really needs coal. So, so most of the time, where you extract coal, you build uh, a power plant to produce electricity. And so you, like that, you can burn the coal there and you can use the electricity. And the electricity is a way of uh, transform the energy to be used by something else. And so that explains why coal is, is used uh, for electricity and oil. It is different that oil it's much more it concentrates much more energy in less uh, volume and it is liquid. So it's much more easy to transport a liquid than a solid. And you in the same amount uh, volume of uh, of uh, coal or uh, oil, you have much more energy into the oil. So that's why oil is used for transportation. So in cars, plane, or so on, because it's the best energy uh, for, for, for mobile things. And so the gas, it's easier to transport gas. So that's why you can uh, build a uh, uh, grid with gas uh, to, to heat coal. So it's easier to heat home with gas than with coal, because with coal, you have to, 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 do, to, uh, to use more energy to transport coal from one place to another. So that's why we prefer to use gas to heat the home, because it's easier to, to to bring gas to homes than coal. And so, for instance, in Germany, where they are still using coal, so you have here maybe uh, uh, very close to uh, Aix la Chapelle, Martin, Aix -la -Chapelle. you have a very big, big uh, open, uh, open, uh, open pit of coal, one of the biggest of Europe. And you can have a look on the map, you can see two big, uh, gigantic uh, poles, and it is an uh, open. Uh, Open mine uh, for coal, and next to that, you have a very, very big uh, uh, electricity uh, power like uh, three or four gigawatts, or one of the biggest of, of Germany. So it still exists here in Europe, and uh, it is, uh, in fact, the main room in the other part of the world. It is coal. It amounts, uh, and if you have a look at the whole primary energy, all primary energy, not electricity, everything. Coal amounts for uh, almost 30% of the primary energy. Uh, oil is like uh, 43% and gas like uh, 25. And the fossil energy amounts for 80% of all the primary energy use. The nuclear is only five. So even if there are 400 nuclear reactors into the world, this right here, 400 nuclear reactors, it's only account for 5% of the So yes, yeah, so here it is called coal and gas. <laughs> but transport, it is oil and building uh, something else. Okay, we will make a short break in two or three slides. I just want to skip it. I'll skip it. Okay. So right now I, I focused on more on climate energy and energy issue. Climate change, sorry, and energy issue. But of course, it's just only one part of the overall sustainability uh, problem. And even if, even if, we succeeded in uh, solving the climate change and energy issues, it will not uh, solve the, the older sustainability issues. So remember, we have uh, several planetary boundary uh, limits. Okay, we could solve uh, climate change, but maybe it will help to, to solve the other issue, but it will not solve them completely. Because even if 
we do not use any more uh, fossil energy. We will still have problems in terms of biodiversity, of fresh water, land, air, water pollution, social and health inequalities. So that's why it's really important to bear in mind that sustainability is a whole, and we cannot only focus on one target. So even if climate change seems to be really important, and it is really important, if we focus all the effort on that, we will skip the other one. And it may be a problem because if we have no biodiversity, for instance, maybe we'll have some problem to produce some food. So it can be cool, great to, to get rid of fuel energy, but if we cannot eat, may be difficult also to live. So always bear in mind that it's a very complex problem that, and all the issues are related and linked and that it, it has to be addressed uh, as a whole problem. I propose you to make a, a short break because uh, I made a lot of slides. Okay. 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 So now let's talk a little bit about energy. What does uh, apply the word energy for you? Like that is not a tricky question. If I say energy, you think? Something that powers everything that we use. Okay. Something to have, okay. Power everything we use, something to have something. It would be difficult to live without energy. <laughs> Uh, we'll skip that one. And do you have any idea of uh, what is one kilowatt hour of energy? What can you do with one kilowatt hour of energy? Do you have any idea? Yeah. Does it represent something for you? One kilowatt hour. One kilowatt hour. Okay. It, so for you, is it a lot of energy or not a lot of energy? Not a lot. One kilowatt hour. Okay. So maybe you have already seen. Uh, okay, in the microgrid course. Or... No, it's, uh, it's what? Uh, ah, okay. Okay. So he saw you that one. So you already, both of you? Yes. And you? No? And you? So I can show, I can show them, if it's okay. Thank you. 
this. You can feel like, yeah, it takes the blood in your mouth. Want to lie down? My legs hurt. <laughs> yeah, they... oh. Put them up. <laughs> the monster is deep. Nobody can believe for, uh, if you do it uh, at the breakfast inside the toaster, nobody can believe how much work it uh, is uh, to, to toast it. Huh? No, no. I, 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 can, I know it now. <laughs> it's crazy. It's fucking hard. Thank you. The picture with you, Robert. Yeah, the brain is small. You look so tiny. My legs are tiny. Yeah, I know. Yes, one kilowatt hour. It's at the same time a lot, but at the same time. It depends what uh, you need to do. So the thing is that, uh, so as human being, we are approximately 2,000 calories per day. And so we are able to, to produce the equivalent of uh, two or three kilowatt hours per day, naturally. But so imagine that we, we would use that energy. So we cannot use all that energy because a lot of energy is uh, for heating our body and so on, but we could use a fraction of that energy to do mechanical uh, work, mechanical work, sorry. But so you, you, you can maybe you can extract, let's say we have a one kilowatt hour per day, so it's not so, so much. And with one liter of oil, if you burn it, you have 10 kilowatt hours of energy. So of course, uh, there is an efficiency to, if you want to do something with that, but imagine in just one, one liter of oil, you have 10 kilowatt hours of energy. And so every year, uh, we approximately need, uh, given our way of life here in Belgium, approximately we are using maybe between uh, 30 or 60 or 100 megawatt of energy. If, for instance, just for heating, if you heat your house, you approximately need 10, 15 megawatt of oil. And that no electricity is around three or five megawatt. Imagine if you take a car and then if you take an airplane and then if you buy some uh, computer and so on. So approximately it's between 50 and 100 megawatt of energy per year that we need per person here in Belgium. So if you use a slave that can produce you maybe one kilowatt or two kilowatt per day, that means in terms of equivalence of energy, we need 400 energetic cells. Every year. So our uh, way we live, the way we use energy, if we tr translate that into human energy, it is 400. So it's so much. So one kilowatt hour at the same time, it is not so much because we use every day device that use a lot of energy. But at the same time, it is a lot because to produce that energy, it's not so easy. And so uh, you, you, you can have more information uh, on the, that article on the John Covici blog that makes all the, calcu the, the calculation by taking a good efficiency to, to have that. And in fact, in, uh, in the USA, for instance, more like one for even energetic say, and uh, in a very poor country, of course, they, they, it's only a few energetic say because they do not have access to the same amount of energy. And so we have already talked a little bit about that uh, a few minutes ago. So when we were talking about the, the world energy primary uh, consumption, it is mainly uh, composed of uh, fuel energy, fuel energy, so oil, coal, and natural gas, but natural gas is gas. <laughs> and if you have a look in terms of, uh, of the amount of energy, the amount uh, for that, that, uh, that part, so it's approximately 80% of all the primary energy, it is oil, coal, and natural gas. And uh, you can see that uh, before the pre-industrial era, so before the starting of the global warming, we were, humanity was only using uh, uh, renewable energy, but biofuel it was mainly wood. 
the, the forest and the, the birds, uh, the, the, the wood uh, to heat yourself or to do something else. And a little bit wind uh, on, on hybrid energy. And then we started first to use coal. It was the first uh, industrial revolution. They first started uh, using coal. And then they, uh, they uh, invented a technological device to use oil, and uh, especially uh, also for transportation. And then we, we also started to use natural gas. And then uh, over the last uh, 50 years, we massively, massively, massively use fuel energy, fossil energy for everything. And so coal mainly for electricity, coal mainly for electricity, oil mainly for transportation, and natural gas mainly for heating. But in fact, uh, it is everywhere. There is not almost nothing here in that room that uh, did not indirectly need uh, fossil energy to be produced, uh, moved here, and so on. And so the nuclear, it's only a very tiny fraction uh, of that. Uh, of that, uh, of that thing. And so what do you think about that? Do you think that, uh, so we have been talking about climate change and energy transition, and I'm pretty sure that uh, you have already get a lot of information that there is an energy transition that is going on, that should be going on. So what do you think when you have a look uh, at, it, at, the, at this series? Do you think an energy transition is going on? But because uh, if, for instance, we, we read uh, the, the headlines of a lot of newspaper, it is or uh, of company, it is uh, a lot of times you can read uh, renewable energy. I don't know for you, but uh, you can uh, you can hear a lot of massive research projects or I don't know project about renewable energy, wind farm, PV, and so on. But in fact, we 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 we, we in the sense we, everybody in society, talk a lot about that. But at the end, what we really use is fossil energy. And there has not been a year, except the COVID, during the COVID-19, there has not been a year where fossil energy, uh, the use of fossil energy has not increased. So even if for uh, the last uh, uh, decades, uh, decision makers say that they have invested a lot into renewable energy. That is true, they haven't invested a lot. They have also invested a lot in fossil energy and it is still increasing. It has not still, not still begun to increase. So you could tell me, oh, but it's strange because, for instance, we are not using uh, almost every European country, we are not uh, using any more coal. It is true in some countries that we have decreased a little bit some uh, of the fossil energy, uh, especially coal. But for instance, oil and gas, it is not true. Because we are still using a lot of gas and coal, uh, on the oil, sorry, in, uh, into the rich country, but into emerging countries, developing countries, they are using uh, a lot of coal. So on, at the global scale, humanity is still using a lot of fossil energy. And here it is the world per capita energy consumption. So it means uh, uh, if we take all the energy that is uh, uh, equally uh, shared among, among all human beings, we would reach around 20 megawatt hour of energy. But of course, in Belgium or France, it is more like 50 or 100 megawatt hour because in Africa, they have less energy and the United States may be more. And you can see how it is uh, uh, equally shared. And it is the fossil energy that are representing uh, the highest share. Uh, here you can see uh, it, it's, it's, it's approximately the same, the, same, uh, the same figure. You can see that, in fact, oil is the main uh, fossil energy that is used. Then it is coal and gas, then followed by nuclear and then other uh, renewable energy. And in terms of, uh, of, uh, of volume, you can see that uh, it's nothing compared to, to fossil energy. There, is, there has been interesting thoughts about the correlation on the link between energy and the, the world gross domestic product, product that is uh, supposedly, supposedly uh, mean to, to represent uh, our uh, economy. And if you, you can make a plot uh, between the, the, the GDP the world GDP and the energy use. 
And it seems that there, there is a, a strong uh, linear correlation between, between them. And so it was, uh, it was made by, uh, by uh, Jean-Marc Jancovici. You can have uh, all the detail on, on, on his blog. And it seems that uh, our world economy, a lot of people say that our world economy could not uh, run without fossil energy because we need, in fact, uh, the, this energy for, for everything. Like you said, it's the power thing, I mean, power car, plane, and so on. And so it seems that the more we use energy, the more it increases the, the GDP. So according to that, it means that if we decrease the fossil energy consumption, one of the risks would be to decrease the GDP and also our way of life, in a sense. So maybe that's why it is so difficult in terms of action for decision makers to do something significantly about fossil energy. It is because right now our economy is powered by fossil energy. So if you want to decrease the use of fossil energy without decreasing our way of life, that means that we need to change our economy, the way uh, the economy works. So it's, it's not so easy, in fact, to say, okay, right now I stop uh, using fossil energy. But just uh, it is just a small warning is not simple as this look. When you are doing some correlation like that between one variable and the other one, as they are both correlated, you do not know which one implies uh, the other one. So for instance, you could say, if I am an economy and that I will bring uh, more services, of course, I will need more energy. But on the other way, you could say, if I bring more energy, it will bring, bring more services because I will, uh, I will use that energy. So you don't know which one is uh, the, the parent of the other one. It's like uh, la poule et l'oeuf. So some people say, okay, be careful about that kind of uh, representation. So the author, Jean-Marc Janco, ici defends this point of view, but always have a critical point of view about this uh, uh, statistics and correlation because sometimes you do not know really uh, which one uh, is the truth. And so ca causality can go both ways between GDP and energy. And it's, it's, it's not so easy to say that it is the energy that an amount, if you increase energy, it implies an increase of GDP or the other way around. It's not so easy. So there is a guy that say, okay, maybe Mark Jankovici is true, but be, be careful. It would need more uh, statistical uh, analysis to be, to be sure about that even if a lot of people think that there is a strong link, of course, between GDP and energy. Here, uh, it represents you, uh, so it is always, uh, it is uh, again the, the GDP, the world GDP, but per capita of world average. And here it is the oil consumption. So not all the, the energy, but only the oil consumption. And you can see also that it seems in terms of statistics that there is strong correlation between the GDP and the oil consumption. And here is what is interesting. Uh, I think in green, it is, yes, in green, it should be the year before, um, uh, um, how can I say that in English? Um, C'est la crise du pétrole dans les années 70. Uh, you know, there was a kind of, uh, it is when the, the OPEP, I don't know how to say that in English, but then when the OPEP say, okay, uh, now we want to decide ourselves the price of oil. And there was a kind of crisis uh, at, at that stage. And uh, they, uh, they uh, decreased uh, the production of oil for a few years. So it contracted the GDP. And then after that, uh, it's, it's like the economy has adjusted to uh, less uh, oil and has been more efficient to do to produce uh, more services with less oil. And here you can see that uh, when it happened, and here you can see that there was a correlation like this. So you have a, a coefficient between the GDP and the oil consumption. And after that, the economy has been more efficient. So it still needs a lot of oil to, to work, but it is more efficient. But in fact, the true challenge would be, according to, to economics, to still increase the GDP, by decreasing the oil consumption, so to do something like that. You know? So yes, a negative, we have a negative slope. So, but it, it seems difficult, but the, 
that would be the ID now to do something like that. But you can see that we are still a long way because uh, over the few years, it is still, uh, we are still using more oil to increase the GDP. Yeah. So that brings the questions of energy, GDP, GDP and decoupling. So to decouple the relation between energy and GDP. So this is what we would like to achieve. In fact, it is to increase, of course, the human well-being. But we would like, because there is also a correlation between the economy activity and the human well-being. It is, it is not because you have a high GDP that you have a, a good well human being, but it helps you to achieve a, a high human well-being. So you would like to have both. And you would like to decouple that from resources use. So like that, if you are able to decouple that, it will uh, imply that your environmental, environmental impact sorry, will decrease. So this is what we would like to achieve, to decouple uh, both, uh, both of them. But the, 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 the thing is, when we have a look at, uh, at the relation between the GDP and the CO2 emissions the energy, is that, okay, it is true that the economy is more efficient than before because for, for to produce the same services, we need, we need less energy. And, and it's quite logic now with car, with the same amount of energy, you can power a uh, car because the efficiency of the car is much more better than 40 years ago. And it is the same thing for plane and for a lot of things, for computer and so on. We are, uh, the efficiency has improved, but not enough. So you can see that there is a, a kind of slight decoupling, but we do not have that, something like that. Because the problem is that we still need to increase the amount of energy to increase the GDP. And as it is fossil energy that is mainly composing that part, it increases the CO2 emission. So, so these are the figures from the International Energy Agency. So th this is something quite uh, serious into the field. The, the International Energy Agency is, uh, is quite famous uh, to, to, to produce reports about uh, energy issues. And most of the time, they are very conservative about that. Okay. Do you know what is the rebound effect? Have you ever heard of it? In fact, I am sure you know what it is, but maybe you have not uh, heard about the name. They fear on them. No? No, never? OK. So it's also known as the Jevons paradox. So it means what? It means the Jevons paradox occurs when technological progress or government policy increase the efficiency with which a resource is used. So it means that, for instance, imagine you have a car that uses uh, 10 liters of oil, oil, oil sorry, to, uh, for 100 kilometers, and uh, you imagine a new car which consumes only five liters to, for these 100 kilometers. And the thing is that, according to that, of course, if your efficiency is increasing, you will, you will use less resources. So it's good. But at the end, the Jevons paradox says that the rate of consumption of that resource rises due to the increasing demand. And so it means that if you increase the efficiency, okay, right now you decrease your consumption, but you will then use more the services. So imagine you have a car, you, you, you needed 10 liters of oil uh, for 100 kilometers. Now it's only five, so maybe you will do 200 kilometers or more people will be able to buy the car because it is uh, cheaper now, because you only need five liters of oil instead of 10. So some people could not, not afford 10 liters, but they could afford to pay for five and it's okay. And so this is the ribbon effect. It is that every time you bring a new technology uh, that will help you to increase the efficiency, which is good, most of the time your uh, demand and consumption will increase because a new bunch of services will, uh, will be uh, enabled by uh, this innovation. And so uh, one, for instance, uh, which is uh, most uh, known is uh, related uh, to, to car or plane. 
And in fact, even if over the last 50 years, the efficiency has drastically increased for uh, powering cars and uh, planes, we still use much more cars and planes than 50 years ago. And it is logic because 50 years ago, it was very expensive to use a car or to take a plane because it was you, you, it used a lot of energy and now it is much more or less energy. So it is uh, much more cheaper. So now you can spend holiday in Spain very easily by taking a plane 50 years ago, maybe it was not possible for most of us. But so, so it's, it's a complicated uh, thing because we would like to have the, the highest efficiency, so to, to use uh, less energy, but in a way, if it increases the demand, it is counterproductive. And this is known as a ribbon effect. So you have the same thing for the for uh, for powering uh, for electric system grid and so on. I will not go into the detail. Uh, another thing is uh, related to the multiplication of uh, of our uh, electronic device. And so, for instance, uh, bracelet measuring physical activities, portable Bluetooth speaker, television, refrigerator, coffee machine, alarm and monitoring system, and so on and so on. This kind of device has drastically uh, increased over the last few years. Uh, for instance, uh, 10, 10 years ago, let's say 10 years ago, they were there. And right now we are here in terms of millions of devices. It is huge and it is because they are much more efficient. So it's much easier to, uh, to power uh, these uh, devices or to produce them. It, it, is, it uses much more or less energy. And so you can produce at a, at a large uh, at a large scale. Much more information is here, and we'll have a, a lecture about uh, about that. And so I have a question for you: How many digital devices do you have? I will start with myself, for instance. So I have a smartphone. <laughs> I have a computer too, but else I also have. A, Three. I also have at home a television, so four. Uh, I have a, a connected watch when I run, so five. Uh, I am pretty sure I can point uh, over a device uh, at home, so I, I have at least five just like that. Pretty sure. And I have also a PC uh, at my office, so six. And you, what, how many devices do you have? Yes. <laughs> we have less than 10. Between 5 and 10? Something like that? Yes. yes. Computer, yeah. PlayStation. PlayStation, yes. PlayStation. Yeah, but it goes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, so at least between 5 and 10, something like that. It's easy to reach 5. So it's very with a computer and so on, and a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, we have the, the old one at home. So it comes also. Which 10 is easy. Sorry? To 10. Which, which 10. To reach 10 is easy. Yes. But if I, it would be fun if I asked that question in 10 years or 20 years, and if I had had that question 10 years ago. <laughs> because maybe 10 years ago, it was only two or three. And 20 years ago, pretty sure maybe it was one. Or zero, because now, now it's very common to have a smartphone, at least a smartphone, a computer, at least a tablet, a PlayStation. Uh, I don't know, you know, you know what I mean. It's, it's just common. And here, if we have a look of the digital device in a household of four person, OECD countries like uh, Belgium, uh, France, uh, the USA. So it's, it's aver in, aver in average. So, 10 years ago, they had four, four persons, two smartphones, two laptops, one tablet. Yes, I, I forgot the Wi-Fi. I, I also got one at home. Huh? Printer, scanner, game console, PlayStation, maybe. Or Xbox, I don't know. In 2017, you had that. E-readers. I, I forgot I have one e-reader or so, you know, the Lizos. I forgot that one. <laughs> Connected television. You have a, a lot of small devices to connect things. Smart meter, connected stereo. Uh, internet connected car, a pair of connected sports shoes. Okay, so you, you, you see there, there, there are a lot of small devices to connect things. In 2020, 
So in 2022, so it is a, a prediction. Probably it will be something like that. A wide scale, yes, yeah, something. Okay. Seven smart light bulbs, digital camera, and so on. So you can see that it is, uh, it is uh, exploding. And this is one of the consequences of the ribbon effect. It is like as we are increasing the efficiency of a lot of things, especially in terms of energy and raw materials, we can produce much more device. And if we have a look at the share of digital technology in final energy consumption, it is approximately growing by 1.5% per year. But between 2013 and 2020, it has almost doubled. And so, so it is huge. And here it is, uh, here, so here it is projection. And so you can see the amount of energy in terms of uh, terawatt. And so it is huge how it is increasing. And so the digital energy consumption is massively increasing. Does the price increase too? Because if we have better efficiency, the technology should be uh, cheaper. Less cheaper than... Yes, in terms of, uh, then you have to look at uh, of the constant price, you know, that you have to analyze the price. But for instance, right now, what you pay for a computer for the same, but you have to take into account the same amount of services. Yeah. Because right now, a computer or a smartphone, in fact, a smartphone right now can do much more things that a, a, a mobile phone 10 years ago. But so for the same price, you can do much more things now. Well, my computer here for the same price now than 20 years ago can, can do much more in terms of power, computation, and so on. So yeah, so the price for almost everything has been uh, decreasing in terms of equal services. And it's the same thing with your car because uh, for, the same, for the same price with a car right now and uh, 40 years ago, now you have a GPS, you have a, an assistance, uh, you have everything you need. You can speak to your car and it will answer you. Uh, you know. But the problem is, so the gain of energy efficiency cannot compensate for the exponential increase in, in the number of digital devices. And it's the same phenomenon for cars, et cetera, et cetera. And that is one of the big problems. And here you can see uh, the, the primary energy consumption. And here you, uh, it is uh, also the same graph uh, figure that I showed you before. So here you have in uh, green the oil, in red the natural gas, and in, in, in uh, gray the coal. And it explains also why. It, is, it has still been increasing because, okay, the economy, everything is much more efficient, but due to the ribbon effect, we are still using much more of these devices. We are producing much more devices. We use much more of car, plane, and so on. And so the, the energy consumption is still increasing. And so that, that, that could explain, that could explain partially, not entirely, but why it is not uh, decreasing, the fossil energy is not decreasing. And it is still a big problem because even if, it is true that the share of renewable has been increasing drastically during the past year, because here it was almost nothing, and now it is much more. Comparing to the fossil energy, it is not enough. And the problem is that we are still increasing the amount of fossil energy. If we had succeed at least to stop increasing, like uh, to have a constant use of, of uh, fossil energy and increase renewable, renewable energy, it would be the first step, but it is not the case, unfortunately. Uh, no, no, it is not here. The, here it is, uh, ah, 2008 crisis. Yes, you are right, the economical crisis. Yes, the subprimes. It, it, uh, here, the, it, here it is not on the picture. You do not have the COVID crisis, but when they will release this, because it is BP, BP is a major a company that releases this report every year, there will be next year and we will have the COVID crisis and it will be the same thing. You will see a decrease because the, the, the economy during a crisis economy uh, stop increasing and it decreases. And remember the, the correlation between GDP and energy consumption, there is a strong correlation between them. So if you decrease your economy in terms of uh, services, it, it means that maybe you use less your car or planes or you have less services and, and indirectly you use less energy. 
And during the subprimes, it was a major financial crisis. And in fact, there, there has been a contraction of the economy and a lot of people could not uh, live as before. Uh, so a lot of people were bankrupt, basically. And so these people that maybe were using car or planes or buying, uh, I don't know, computer devices and so on, they were not doing that. So of course, there has been a decrease in carbon energy consumption. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Me, the same thing. I was uh, at the beginning of my study. I did not realize that. Uh, but it will be the same for the COVID crisis. Okay. Completely the so same. It's just because the whole world consumes less. Yes, yes. Because, uh, because there, there is something that is happening. So during the financial crisis, it was purely financial. But during the COVID crisis, it was something else. But we were all at home. And we, it was much more difficult to, to, we, to go to the restaurant, cinema, I don't know. So you use less energy. People that were going on vacation in Spain, I don't know, Morocco, France, they were not doing that. So indirectly, you use less energy. And so regarding the rebound effect, what do you think of 5G? Have you heard about the debates, so the issue related to 5G? Uh, compensate. Uh. <laughs> that's, that's a big question. That's a big question. Each time we have a new uh, technological innovation, most of the time we bring us very useful services that we did not have before. And it is true. And sometimes a lot of them help us, but uh, some, but also it brings also indirect use that we would have not think about it. Probably before doing the 4G, people that were designing 4G did not think about people who were, uh, that now are watching. Uh, you know, a video of cats in 4K on the smartphone. That was probably not the first intention of, of designing 4G, probably. <laughs> I imagine. And so, so that, that's one of the main problems with this kind of technology uh, innovation because most of the time when they are designed, it's for useful things. But the problem is that it brings a lot of uh, other usage that maybe are not so. You have right to watch that. Huh? You know, I, it's not what I say. Huh? But, but, but the problem is that it uses a lot of energy. And if we would like to prioritize some energy use, maybe we would think about something else. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a debate. But there is a big, big debate about that. Do we really need, do we really need 5G? So some people will say, OK, yes, it's true, because for autonomous car, maybe it could help us, or for medical application. And some of the other people say, OK, but the problem is not there. Maybe people will do something else and it would be uh, increase the consumption consumption of energy and so on. Maybe we'll talk about that. There is a, a, a special report of uh, about that thing in another lecture. So I will uh, now finish uh, the first lecture by by uh, just mentioning some some of the sustainability challenges that we are facing, and maybe. Uh, they are, uh, they are in the question how to live x times better by using x times less resources, how to get x times more meaning with x times fewer things. So, what do you think uh, about these questions? Do you think it could be uh, one way of uh, seeing the sustainability challenges? Uh, yes. Yes, but the question, no, no, but can we do it? <laughs> yes. 
sometimes I, I find that it's a bit idealistic based on how we live now. Mm -hmm. I don't know in the future, but sometimes it seems just too beautiful to mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's difficult. So will technology save us? Can technology save us? What do you think? Yes. Not only. Not only. I, I think there must be a change of mentality. I think it will depend on how we use this ah. technology. I think that it will be a bad thing. It will destroy us. <laughs> <laughs> The question is how we use it. I yes. agree with you. Yes. And uh, you have a lot of professors in different, in different courses, and some uh, professors here at university are very famous for saying that technology will save us. In my opinion, I am more in the, agree with you with the say it's not only technology, but the way we use it. Uh, well, I will. Uh, so. We need to maybe reinvent ourselves. So it means a lot of things. It's uh, so th there is a few list of things, uh, like for instance, collaboration instead of competitions, the importance of the collective working together, uh, to, to, to think differently about the winner and where the loser, to evaluate all the cost of innovations, okay, uh, new, to build new instruments, new needs, new criteria of success. So maybe for instance, the GDP, for the economics, not a, a, a good metric to quantify the, 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 the economy. So some people are designing new way of quantifying uh, uh, the economy uh, to, to think at the same time as the technical economic responsibility consequences. For instance, for 5G, 5G, you cannot think of 5G just only in terms of technique. You have to think about how people would use it. So to, to know if it's uh, worth, worth it or not. So there is a lot of things uh, to think about it. And then to transition maybe to more relevant technology. So maybe uh, we need more uh, tools like life cycle assessment. Have you ever already heard about that life cycle assessment? Yes, a little bit. It is a way of uh, quantify, quantifying for a given device. So for instance, a computer, all the resources you need from a uh, cradle to grave. So from the beginning of extracting raw material up to recycling and destroying the food. Uh, maybe to build the circular economy, but with recycling as a last resort. So it means maybe to re more to repair, to reuse, uh, to fight against program obsolescent, etc., etc. Et so there are there are a lot of ways and direction maybe to help to achieve uh, this uh, sustainability target. But as you said, maybe it's too too beautiful. But the the, the thing is, uh, are we really going to do it? So to, to conclude this first lecture, uh, the course perimeter will be more focused on climate and uh, energy, but uh, with the tools of the climate and digital career, you will see two tools in terms of education. So to how to educate people about uh, this uh, issue in fact, and maybe one of the, the question about uh, all the direction that uh, yes, it seems very beautiful, but it's very difficult to achieve this direction because there is a gap between rhetoric and action. Maybe one of the main drivers of that is because people are not uh, really so educated about it. In fact, maybe if people are more educated, they will be, uh, be they will better understand what they need to achieve, and maybe they will put some pressure on decision maker to to build better position. But maybe it's a dream. One thing uh, to, to, that you have to, to, to bear in mind after this lesson is that um, there, there is a ribbon effect that is linked with energy consumption. And right now, the uh, fossil energy that is composing 80% of the primary energy is still increasing. The consumption of primary uh, fuel energy, fossil energy, sorry. Even if the share of renewable has increased, it is true. But in comparison, the fossil energy have also increased. So there is a big challenge in terms of fossil energy to reduce the consumption. And so the, the next 
so here today we have seen the, the kickoff and the sustainability challenges. We will not do the activity analyzer report. We, we do not have time for that. But the next lecture is an activity. So here today it was a presentation. So the next lecture is a, a climate college. And so it is a, a, a game with the card and uh, we, will, uh, we will play that game. It will last approximately uh, three hours and it will help us to introduce then uh, the climate change that will be uh, given by a presentation of the climatologist, uh, climatology Xavier Fabas. Thank you for your attention.